Our panel today is Getting It Right, Media Coverage of Religious Freedom. And we have several wonderful journalists with us today who try to do that every day to get it right. And we have also some other attorneys that are joining us on this panel to talk about how religious groups can better tell their own story in the media. So I've been on the receiving end of many journalists' questions, and I'm feeling pretty excited today to be sitting in the moderator's seat. So I'm the one asking the questions of the journalists. <laughs> um, and I think we're gonna have a really interesting discussion. And uh, like I said, we'll open it up to questions at the end. So if you do have a question that pops up during our discussion, feel free to just jot it down and uh, remember it, and we'll talk about it at the end. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. You can read their bios in the program. But we are joined today by Emma Green from The Atlantic, Terry Mattingly from Get Religion, Bobby Ross from The Christian Chronicle, Sahar Aziz from Rutgers University Law School, and Holly Hallman from the Baptist Joint Committee. <clears throat> So thank you all very much for joining us on this panel today. And I wanted to start um, with an opinion editorial that was actually published last month in the Wall Street Journal's monthly column, Houses of Worship. And the editorial uh, had this headline, it's hard to find God on the front page. And the thrust of the opinion was that the decline in specialized religion beat reporters means that religious news often gets short shrift and inaccuracies result in lots of corrections. <clears throat> and the columnist said this, knowledgeable reporters are needed who get the subtleties of this difficult beat. That lack of intellectual co capital inevitably leads to embarrassing corrections. It's a shame so few outlets seem to take religion seriously anymore. Done right, the religion beat can be quite profitable. Anyone who wants to understand the forces behind much of today's news needs to understand faith. So this column highlighted several factors that have led to religion reporting that is less than ideal. First, a lack of knowledgeable reporters. Second, a lack of commitment by news organizations to cover religion seriously. And third, a lack of recognition of the connection between major news stories and the religious motivations behind them. So I'd like to start our panel today by asking our religion reporters to respond to this editorial. To what do you attribute this downturn in religion coverage generally? Is there a paucity of knowledgeable reporters to cover religion? And what makes the religion beat so difficult? So we'll start with you journalists first. Well, so I'm so glad to be here. And I have to say, in a little bit of a nerding out moment, uh, I'm sitting up here with some folks who I admire immensely and whose work I follow. Um, in particular, I'm sitting next to Terry Mattingly, who's like the godfather of all religion reporting and religion news. Um, so I'm having a little bit of a, of a, a starstruck moment. Um, but from my, from my seat uh, being starstruck, uh, I'll say that I have found a lot of uh, that editorial to be true in my experience. Uh, there's a small band of religion reporters who are employed at national publications that are mainstream, not affiliated with a particular church or uh, religious bent. And we're a, a, a small but mighty crew. It tends to be a very nice beat, which I suppose uh, is very on brand for religion reporting, for the religion reporters to be nice people. Um, um, we tend to support each other, we retweet each other, we praise each other, we're friends. Uh, and I think that's able to exist, that camaraderie, in part because it is such a small band of people who are assigned full time to this beat, uh, much smaller than you would think relative to the importance that religion plays in American society and internationally, and also relative to the number of people in the United States who themselves are religious. Uh, to me, the biggest thing, which wasn't necessarily highlighted directly in your comments, but that I think um, undergirds all of this, is the lack of uh, 
the permanent religion beat on the local level um, at either regional newspapers or local newspapers. Um, I think this is part of a greater story of decline in the news industry that has made it impossible for some of uh, the functions that 10, 20 years ago would have been standard to be sustained. Um, but ultimately, that hurts all of us because local news reporters, um, beat reporters in these communities really do the hard work of shoe leather on the ground, understanding what's going on on a day over day basis in their communities. And losing that kind of infrastructure for understanding religion broadly in the United States is devastating. When you read the headline on top of that editorial, uh, as the official old person in this set, I immediately thought of the fact that the headline on the cover story that I wrote for Quill Magazine on this topic in 1983, raise your hand if you were not born in 1983. <laughs> the headline on that was Religion News, colon, No Room in the Inn. And it was a study of why American newsrooms don't cover religion. And at that time, that and a cover story in Sojourners were pretty much the only things that anybody had written on this topic. The Los Angeles Times, the late great David Shaw, followed up with a major series of articles about six or seven years later. But basically the ongoing question is why doesn't the religion beat get treated like other major beats that newspapers seem to respect? One of the mantras of Get Religion is that we are seeking journalistic solutions to journalism problems. I know a lot of religious people who start off with, well, the press hates us. This is not a positive, constructive comment <laughs> you know, to, to make if you're trying to improve you know, something in journalism. Journalism will be improved by people who love it, not by people who hate it. But when you talk about journalism solutions to this problem, hiring experienced, even award-winning religion reporters is job one. The question that's dominated my entire career in this field is, why don't newspapers do that? I mean, now, now today, we understand that jobs are short, budgets are tight. We all know, we all know that's a problem. Because the other things you do is you hire a professional, you give them the time and money it takes to do it, and you give them inches of copy or if anybody in network television ever hires a religion reporter, you give them some time on the air. Mm. Well, there's unlimited time and space now. This is really all about money and this decades-old question of why don't the people who run newsrooms hire skilled, trained professionals? Mm. And I still don't have an answer to that. I think to some degree it's because the subject intimidates and scares a lot of people. And they are scared of making mistakes. They are terrified of making mistakes. They're terrified of admitting they made mistakes. I, the New York Times has not run a correction yet to the fact that Jesus is not buried at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You know, they have said that several times. I have yet to see a correction. Um, that's kind of hard to admit you, you wrote that and that Christians believe that. So. Today, what we really are asking for is simply better journalism. And there are a lot of very skilled, award-winning, unemployed religion reporters. And that's a problem. I guess it makes, it makes no sense, really, to, to decry lack of uh, religion reporters if you're constantly just beating up the media, right? I mean, the fact that there's so much criticism of the media in general um, does not add to, like, we need more religion reporters. Well, I think that making accurate criticisms about mistakes in the press can be constructive. Uh, we sure. certainly try to do that at Get Religion, but most of the horrifying mistakes that are made are not made by trained religion reporters. Now, we may have debates about how you do quality coverage on some of those issues. Quickly. Those are debates in-house, we talk about it. The horrible mistakes are made when the beat gets handled by people who don't know the facts. Bobby, do you want to chime in? I, I would. I would just quickly add to or echo what Terry and Emma said. I think a, a good example was last week with the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in Fort Worth. You had the Dallas Morning News, which used to have maybe five or six full-time religion writers, a weekly religion section, in-depth, investigative and explanatory journalism on religion, 
which no longer has even a single full-time religion writer. In part, you know, that's partly related to economics, but it's, it's still really sad because you're, you're in a city where religion is such a major force, and you've got a newspaper that has two or three full-time people covering the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers, but you have the Southern Baptist Convention, which for the first time in years is suddenly a big news event because of some issues in neighboring Fort Worth with the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary president. And so the morning news covers that story, but the coverage, you know, and, and they put it on the front page, but it's so shallow. They, they're, they're talking about women's roles in the Southern Baptist Convention and don't talk to any women at all in their story. The day before that, they have another front page story kind of quasi-related to that convention where they cover a crusade meeting at, at the big football stadium at Arlington, Texas, and the coverage is just so shallow. And to me, it's really sad because you've got a major newspaper where if you were to invest resources in a religion writer, even just one, you could have somebody who could really be doing some mm -hmm. tremendous journalism. And if I could just jump in, uh, as first I should disclose, I'm not a journalist, I'm an attorney. Um, but I am a major consumer of, of journalism, especially in my work. And, you know, when you are a, re a religious minority that is perhaps one of the smallest religious minorities, Muslims in particular, um, this problem, this systemic problem, has very devastating effects because what happens is you have journalists who are not on the religion beat at all, so they don't even claim to be qualified and they're usually talking about politics, about international affairs, foreign affairs, war, and then they start talking about Islam and Muslims. And so then Muslims become associated with terrorism and war and migration uh, consistently, and there's no one actually covering them uh, from the religious beat, much less from someone who understands the faith or how to cover faith in the United States. So. I would echo some of those concerns of needing competent professional people who are familiar with these diverse communities. Great, so Emma, you've said in a previous interview that, um, and I'm quoting here from an interview you did, that many issues that are putatively economic or political or cultural are deeply rooted in people's faith, moral values, and metaphysical commitments. So it seems to me this sort of touches on the third point from that editorial that we discussed earlier, which is that there's often a lack of recognition of the connection between sort of major news stories and the religious motivations that are behind them. So putting aside sort of the journalists and the religion beat, but mainstream journalists who do other beats often miss these very important religious undertones in their news coverage. So I guess, two-part question, why, why do you think that is, that religion is sort of written out of other major beats? And then how do we correct that? I mean, it seems like, as you recognized, there are so many stories where there are religious motivations or religious themes underlying them, and they're just completely written out. How do we address that to get it right? I think there is a lot built into the beat structure, which uh, is emulated in newsrooms, but also uh, mirrored in, in magazines and the type of place where I work, where people are assigned to a certain beat, and really what they're being assigned to is a worldview and a framework. Um, I like to say it's the door that you're walking through in order to get to the story. So people who are on the business desk, who are on the politics desk, they're trained to see the world through the framework of politics or economics, through pop culture, depending on what your, your given beat is. Um, not having full-time beat reporters who are asked explicitly to walk through the door of religion, to be looking first at the way that someone's faith commitment, or more broadly, the way that a community's set of values and principles and theological beliefs is motivating a certain conflict or a certain policy preference or what have you, uh, that's that's a real loss because you you never then get that that process of really understanding what might be underlying some of the biggest events in our in our public life. Um, I think to fix it, a couple of things. Um, you know, I am probably part of just a chorus of people who think religious literacy in the newsroom is important across those desks. So even if you're walking through uh, one kind of door, the politics door, the economics door, at least having the literacy to know what you're seeing when you get inside. Um, and the second is just empowering people to be comfortable 
in the realm of religion. Um, I think this is another major aspect, um, is sort of a discomfort, particularly among reporters who might come from a more secular background, a more liberal background, a more coastal background, with talking to people in the language of belief, uh, talking about belief in God, talking about uh, some of those core principles that they, they hold most closely, getting people comfortable with that and willing to foreground those aspects of a story rather than put them in the background or in paragraph 10, uh, I think is important for getting the story right. A wonderful image for that came from Bill Moyers, uh, an experienced person in the world of journalism and in politics. His image is that a lot of the people covering religion are tone deaf to the music of religion. They're actually in events and they don't actually hear the same things that other people hear because they don't recognize the symbols, the language, or whatever. I, uh, an example, if I can, as we would say in the Bible Belt, if I could go to Medlin, during the last election, if you contrasted the Washington Post coverage of evangelicals, that was done by their religion desk with the coverage of the same groups of people done by their political desk. It was genuinely shocking. The range of voices quoted, I mean, the religion desk even knows there is an evangelical left. Mm. I, mean, I mean, so you, you saw more people quoted, more informed people quoted, and then on politics, it was all just 81% of white evangelicals are voting for Trump and they love him, you know, over and over and over. And that just wasn't the whole story. I could point to a book for this real quickly. If you're familiar with the book, What's the Matter with Kansas? This is actually a political science book that perfectly illustrates this. It can't figure out why Kansas continues to vote against its own economic and political interests. Well, the book isn't considering the role of religion in moral and social issues, which explains a lot of the equation. Um, so I want to turn to our lawyers on the panel now and, and ask you, what are some good examples that you have seen of particularly good reporting on religion? Because I don't want this to be sort of bashing the media today. I think there are some very good you know, reporters and, and good reporting out there on, on religion. Um, can you cite some examples of particularly good reporting where they got it right from your perspective? Um, and, and why did these stories strike the right balance? if you could sort of talk about that from your own perspective. Sure, um, well, the stories that I'm most familiar with are the, are the ones that we follow and that we are part of on the religion freedom, the religious freedom beat. So um, when I think about, it's, it's a part of reporting on religion, is reporting on religious freedom, religious freedom cases, religious freedom um, controversies. And actually the major papers do a, a pretty good job on, uh, I, I found, on a lot of the religious freedom cases because they are trained to cover legal news. And legal news is sometimes, is difficult anyway and pretty technical to describe to a lay audience uh, what's important about a certain case. And um, so you would have uh, reporters at the Washington Post or New York Times or LA Times who cover the Supreme Court, for example, that would, because they've covered the Supreme Court for many years, and there's usually two religion cases every year at the Supreme Court, they have pretty good facility with religion. And so I find often um, the stories, even the, the stories on, on Masterpiece Cake, for instance, I found the headlines are often confusing. And as I understand from my journalist friends, uh, writing headlines is a totally different skill, right, than writing the stories. Uh, headlines are sometimes not so clear, don't really help that much. But if you read into the stories, they were pretty good on, um, on, the, on the cases. Again, it's a religious freedom and religion. These are specialized areas, right, where we would all benefit from more uh, well-trained um, journalists. Uh, but at least in religious freedom cases, we can sometimes benefit um, uh, from reporters who've done other Supreme Court work. The other thing we can do, of course, is um, where I've seen some of the better reporting is where you may start with the lawyers and get to the, uh, the parties and then the people supporting them to get to the other religious voices to say why other groups care about the case. So apart from religious freedom, though, what about stories about Baptists? You know, what is your experience with that and getting it right? Well, I 
fortunate sometimes to get the call to be able to give the background work on, to give the background story on a religious freedom case and then to get to the point below it to refer someone, to refer a reporter, and they are eager to follow up with those reports to a pastor who can say how this works in their congregation. Um, I mentioned the other day one of the big stories uh, in the last year or so has been uh, this idea that um, about the 501c3 regulation that uh, requires that 501c3 nonprofit organizations not endorse um, or oppose candidates for office, and it sometimes seems a religious freedom issue, has been put out in the media that way as something that needs to be changed. But there, we saw lots of stories where they never talked to any religious leaders or churches. And then you only have to dig a little bit deeper to see that no denominations came out in support of this change. So there was the political story sort of deferred to the political voices. And it makes sense, of course, you're going to quote the president, you're going to, you know, it's, it's obviously newsworthy what the president says. But to, uh, but that kind of story that says this is for, this is about religious freedom, and it affects churches, it seems like you would want to talk to church people, people who go to church, people who are pastors in churches, and when you get below the surface, the story's totally different. Um, there were examples of, of stories where we were able to direct reporters to you know, go talk to some other people and round out that reporting that was really um, effective. So I take seriously the responsibility that I have and the opportunity when a reporter calls, um, and I urge people that I'm in contact with, uh, church leaders, to do the same, to try to help the stories by helping the reporter get it right. So. And, and what about training those local leaders to deal with the media? I mean, it seems to me that's another aspect of this story as well, is, right, is helping the local leaders uh, be able to tell their stories yeah. better. Right? I, loved, I loved Emma's uh, encouragement this morning to say, have a soundbite ready. And because and I took it to mean really think about what's important to you so that you are ready to help the story in a concise way. Is that what you meant, Emma? I did, although <laughs> I, I certainly would not want to be on record as the journalist who just goes after sound bites. No, the rest, of, the rest of what she said is she wants that she appreciates that someone's there to give the bigger story, the, the background, which is usually the role that I get. I get to give some background, some feedback. If it's a story about RIFRA, because I serve the group that um, headed the coalition when it was passed, and boy, people don't understand what RIFRA is now, and there's all kind of different opinions about it. But I can give that background. I can, I can direct their reporter to the website. I can tell them about people on either side and um, kind of get deeper into the story. So that's helpful to the reporter, but so is the concise, um, the concise soundbite that it's not understood the way it was in 1990 or something like that. And um, I'm very sympathetic to the desire that reporters have to want to hear from religious leaders and sometimes the difficulty they have. The religious leaders that I know and work with are people in churches, they are busy with church work. You know, they're, uh, preparing, they're preparing their sermons, they're organizing their congregations to do service work. I mean, they're doing the work of the church. That's very different from the, the world where people are just trying to get on TV. Or be, <laughs> be get their voice heard in the media, and so we really need to sort of bridge these two worlds by um, encouraging. I think there's work to be done on both sides, both encouraging religious leaders not to be afraid to explain to a reporter their perspective, and for the reporter to say, "Tell me more. What do you mean by that?" So that the reporter can understand and do a better job of of describing what this person's. Can I turn from. to you, Sahara, yeah, and you sure. can answer that question? It's just examples of where you think journalists have got it right for your particular faith right. community. So, first, just to give the background on what I tend to focus on is the civil rights of Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians, which includes religious freedom and actually tends to be one of the biggest civil rights issues that they that they face, at least in the past 20 years. And so I don't have any specific examples, but I can tell you trends. Uh, the, the first type of story that I find to be very helpful is the one that humanizes them, right? That where you have personal stories and they talk to different people and they're just average, ordinary Muslims that are trying to make a living, that are trying to raise their children, and that are facing challenges as a result frequently of some form of bigotry or discrimination. I mean, it's unfortunate that oftentimes the story is connected somehow to either you know, terrorism, war, migration, or discrimination. And I hope that in the future we'll have more, and I think we're starting to see that slowly, but in the future there'll be stories more about entrepreneurship and um, you know, education policy and you know, very, 
economic issues, et cetera. Um, so I think things that humanize Muslims are, are really important. And I've noticed I, I get called frequently by the media. And maybe 10 years ago, more frequently than not, I would be asked for my opinion, my analysis, my professional analysis as a lawyer, or as, a, as a policy wonk. And then more recently, in the last five years, I've had journalists contact me and say, no, we don't want to talk to you. We want to talk to ordinary Muslims that go to this mosque that we're covering, or Muslims who live in this neighborhood because we're talking about broader issues and we want that community's voice to be heard along with Latinos and, and Catholics and Protestants and African Americans, et cetera. Uh, so I have noticed that trend, which I think is, is really important, and I hope it, it continues. Um, and then finally, the other the stories that complicate things, this is a challenge that media faces. The simpler it is, the more you get readership, but the simpler it is, usually the more inaccurate it is. Life is complicated, right? and the issues that you all cover, particularly on the religion beat, I think is very complicated. And, um, and when you think about Islam and Muslims, talk about an oversimplified uh, topic of 1.8 billion people, over tens of countries, many of whom are immigrants from that country here, for those countries here, and you want to cover them in, you know, using three or four key words. It just, it doesn't work. So you need many, many different stories that break it down. Uh, so the, those are the types of stories that I found to be very helpful, the ones that show the impact on these families and the impact on, for example, religious freedom infringements. So I find that the stories who are subtly trying to send the message, you know, because these individuals are no longer able or are afraid to exercise their religious freedom, go to the mosque, wear a headscarf, uh, tell their, ask for accommodation for prayer or fasting. As a result, religious freedom in America is under threat. All of us are being threatened. So connecting their experiences with larger fundamental values so that to, to make the reader understand, I should care about this, not because of this person's experience, but because this actually affects what I care about and how it affects me and my children. I, I would just comment on the, I guess, you, Holly mentioned the need for both sides to, I guess, be involved here. And I think for journalists, to me, it's always helpful if I can convince the person that I, I am genuinely interested in what you're going to say and I want to be fair and here's some links where I've covered similar issues and covered both sides fairly because there's there's a lot of people out there who either they've been burned personally or they've seen their po point of view manipulated by the media so I think it helps to both try to develop a personal connection and also be willing to be fair and be willing to take the time to hear somebody out rather than, you know, hopefully not calling and saying, I need, I need a sound bite in the next 60 seconds because I'm going to press right now. So, could I ask a, offer a quick point? Yeah. In terms of what local clergy could do to, under, to kind of work their way into this, yeah. I can't stress too much that we need more major religious institutions that at least have a media committee that at least have two or three people who try to learn how to work with the press. And at the associational level in a lot of Protestant churches, they could be doing this at the regional mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But the question I try to tell, teach ministers to ask, and I once taught in a seminary, is stop asking reporters where they go to church. <laughs> I mean, there's so many clergy I know that that's the first question they wanna ask. All right, who are you? What's your brand? whatever, and instead of asking that question, ask them how long they've covered religion. Hmm. And then what they tell you back about their own journalism experience or what they've done to train for this beat might help you know what kinds of information mm -hmm. you need to get for them. Maybe you need an FAQ that you can hand them, maybe a list of potential sources. But once again, it's a journalism problem. Mm -hmm. Face it that way. So, so in addition to the media committee, in addition to some of Holly's recommendations for local leaders and how they can better interact with the press, sort of more broadly stepping back and looking at the question of um, to what extent can religious groups or religious people generally help correct these inaccuracies in the media by telling their own story more effectively? Like, what does that look like? What, what are your recommendations to religious groups and to religious organizations to help journalists do their do job to get it right and to, 
to tell their own story better. Um, perhaps some examples of where this has not gone so well and some examples where this has gone well. What, what is your advice to, to religious groups on this point? Anyone? No, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to. That's yeah. actually a really Im important topic. So first, and we've been working on this a lot in terms of the, the nonprofit or, or civil society organizations that include also religious groups, is training more people to write op-eds. So many of us know about the op-ed project, which is focused on bringing more women into editorial, into you know, op-ed writing, to diverse voices from women. So it's, I think it's the same concept uh, for whatever religious community that you work with. Writing an op-ed is a skill. It's a skill that even as a lawyer I have to, I can write, I've been trained to write, that's my craft, but op-ed writing is its own craft. So one is, is having that formally part of uh, a skill set for your congregation that's interested, uh, young people, you know, especially diverse voices, blogs, which is happening organically um, and sometimes maybe to a fault. But there are many blogs, and I can just cite a few if people are interested, uh, that talk that, that bring the voices of American Muslims and Muslims who were raised here or children of immigrants. Uh, Patheos, Muslim Matters, uh, Muslim Girl, uh, Islamic Monthly, which is actually a magazine. So there's been a, a notable effort in the past about five to eight years by these diverse Muslim American communities to, to bring their own voices and not expect journalists to do all the work, but to meet the journalists halfway. And then there are many speakers bureau, ING, I, I believe it's called ING, um, that creates speakers who then can become not only speakers at events like these, but can also talk to journalists about particular events. Uh, so those are some of the examples that I would, that I would cite, um, at least for those particular communities. And that way, it's getting easier for journalists, it seems like, you know, that there are so many blogs, so many podcasts that really, when a, a, a journalist calls me, I can kind of tell the quality of the journalist by <laughs> when they tell me what they've already seen or read. I mean, because they should have done some research. Um, I mean, sometimes I could be the first call, and that's, that's an honor, too, if I get to be the first person they call. But um, <laughs> there's so much that's already out there about uh, diverse religious communities from their own voices uh, via blogs and podcasts and things like that. I will say one, one challenge, and this is unique to any new immigrant community. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the factors, the realities of being a new immigrant community is that uh, many people, English is not their first language, mm. right? And uh, one thing that we faced um, in the three to five years after 9-11 when there was disproportionate focus on these communities through the lens of terrorism is that we had people speaking to the media who were very well versed in, let's say, Islam or understood the community and well respected, but unfortunately because English wasn't their first language and sometimes they were dealing with journalists who were acting in bad faith and frankly with nefarious intent to try to you know, perpetuate the stereotypes that Muslims are terrorists, they would end up getting caught um, with these sound bites that would then just perpetuate the, the negative stereotypes. So one challenge is finding the right spokespeople. I, I mean, for these communities, language matters, but it's not just language, right? And making sure that it's <coughs> spokespeople that can uh, bring different messages <coughs> and different uh, images, different voices, because there's, I mean, it's just like what you were saying about the evangelical Christians. If you, if the media keeps portraying them and bringing the voices of one particular frame, which could represent arguably 1% or 40%, who knows, that's all that we're going to read. Um, and that tends to be a real big issue on women's issues you know, in these communities, is women are consistently being portrayed as oppressed and meek and uneducated, and, which, and the facts are the complete opposite. The data is, is very clear. Uh, so, so I would just point that out. This is a unique challenge those communities face. So I am not here to media train you all, and um, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, be up here trying to sort of give uh, training tips to people who will be on the other side of the phone when I'm doing an aggressive interview. Um, <laughs> but I can say the sources that I come back to again and again all share a couple of characteristics. 
Um, the first is people who are willing to get on the phone to, as Holly said, give background rather than expecting that during that conversation or even the next conversation they'll be the one that's quoted. Um, I think people who really understand the media understand that there are many ways to influence the narrative and being quoted by name is not the only way to help get inside of the head of reporters and how they're thinking. Um, those people who do give me that background and are willing to answer my questions and walk me through. Um, I also trust the straight shooters, uh, people who don't seem to have an agenda that they're trying to move forward, or even if they do, who are frank about what their critics would say, who are frank about the challenges within their communities. Um, often communities are defensive, um, and understandably so when they're talking to reporters, they want to be portrayed in the best possible light. Uh, and there are reporters who wanna just take that one sizzling quote that makes it seem like everyone's fighting and hates each other and sort of stir things up. Journalists look for conflict and change as a part of trying to make news. Um, but I, I think people who are willing to talk frankly and straightforwardly about challenges facing their own groups and different perspectives are also people who win my trust over time. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Another practical tip, never be afraid of recording your own interview. Sometimes that's considered a hostile act by some r reporters, but I think sometimes if you know you're dealing with very tricky subjects, it's good to know what you actually said. Yeah. Now, the other side of that, if that's the stick, the carrot, in the 20 years I taught journalism in Washington. I'm just figuring out how to do that, Terry. You gotta tell me later, I got my notes, I got my uh, phone, uh, I gotta, now I gotta I tape just, myself. I just had a tape, just have a tape just, recorder yeah. there. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, Especially if it's a face-to-face -face interview. There are, I know some, some situations where the entire dynamic has been changed. Reporters now are so rushed. They have to do so much material by internet and by telephone. If you offer them a face-to-face -face interview, that also gives you a chance to make sure it's being taped by both sides. Um, my experiences with the LDS churches, that's often the ground rule. But here's the more positive thing. In 20 years of teaching journalism in Washington, the single question I've taught my students that helped the most, Washington is such a politicized town and so, so divided. At the end of your interview, ask this person who's on one side of a hot debate, ask them this question, who are the people on the other side of this issue that you respect? Students have gotten more great contacts out of that question than anything else I've ever taught them in Washington. And if a group is so politicized they refuse to answer that question, that tells you something as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I wanna just sort of jump off of something that Emma just said about you know, what makes the headlines, sort of the division and the conflict and the change or sort of what drive the headlines. And you know, I, I've noticed this in, in reporting is that you know, often it's some human failing or some doctrinal position underlying a certain public policy issue that stands in the way of social change or a certain political agenda and that's what grabs the headlines. So it seems to me that there's sort of a big difference between what religious people see as newsworthy about religion and what more secular news organizations see as newsworthy about religion. Um, so the things that lead to you know, spiritual commitment or deep religious fulfillment um, or the good that religions do aren't always the things that make the headlines. So how can journalists do justice to that sort of internal experience of being religious and what religious people value about religion while also responding to the obvious demands of traditional news organizations? Anyone wanna tackle that one? Oh, I <laughs> yeah. think it helps, and I guess to get back to, to part of what we were saying earlier about when you have news organizations that do devote resources to a full-time religion person, it's easier for somebody who is following religion all the time to, I guess, see the picture of what faiths are doing or, or what the, the good things that they do as opposed to just if somebody's accused of sexual abuse or if there's somebody's connected to a terrorist event or, you know, I'm thinking there was a story in Texas recently where a church had some door hangers where they were kind of accused of, in their view, they were just preaching traditional Christian doctrine, their belief that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But other people in the community thought they were kind of bigoted 
But, you know, suddenly this church, it's a 1,500-member African-American church, and suddenly they're on the front page, and the story's going all over the country. And, and it was again, it was the Dallas Morning News covering it kind of as a spot story, which it was news, and I understand why it was news, but you've also got a church that has been involved in this in its neighborhood and its community and is a growing active church and I can find no evidence that they've ever been mentioned in the Dallas Morning News before mm -hmm. until two people tweet something negative about them and, and suddenly there's a social media storm and this church is in the news. Yeah. I, I would pick up on that you know I think um, some of what you're alluding to Bobby is the importance of a long-term relationship that's right. seeking to understand communities on their terms not for a flash in the pan scandal, but for who they are over the long run. And I really agree with that as sort of a base premise for how to go in. But uh, to be a little bit contrarian, I disagree a little bit with the premise of Hannah's question because I don't think it's the job of reporters to uh, report sunny stories that make people feel good and feel happy. Sometimes those are the stories, that's the news, um, but that's PR. And there's a, there's a place for that, but I think journalists ultimately are trying to find um, facts that are relevant to people's lives, stories that help uh, their readers understand the world that they're living in, and that ultimately can give people a sense of uh, where power is in, in their societies and their communities, and how that's operating, and who holds it, and, and changes to that. Um, another way of putting that is journalists and storytelling, um, journalism and storytelling is about isolating tension. Um, but not to be too contrarian, I don't wanna go too far in that direction. Um, I don't think finding tension is all about finding bad stories or making out certainly religious groups to always be the bad guys. And I think that's where mainstream media often falls short. Um, there's a lot of interest in the kind of dogged reporting that turns up ill will or malice or irresponsibility in religious institutions and by religious in individuals, and sometimes that's merited. Um, but there's not necessarily enough interest in other kinds of tension, um, intra-communal tensions, uh, tensions where perhaps a religious leader is the one who's pushing back against something that's happening in their community and they face a lot of adversity. Um, so I look for that. Um, I look for good stories that help people understand and that ultimately are, are trying to understand those things that really really drive us. I think, um, Bobby, that story is really interesting to me and show it again shows the responsibility that religious people have in the society today to speak and to explain and to engage and to get outside your immediate religious bubble to talk to other people like we're doing at this conference because um, what that story needed was that church needed understanding in their community about who they are and what they right. believe and what they do and a much bigger picture than this one incident that someone, this one aspect that someone takes from a totally probably non-religious perspective to go after them. And so um, I think we do have to understand that we have a problem with kind of lack of religious literacy in our society as a whole. And so both, I think journalists have a role in, in reporting that story, which if the story is the exciting tension, horrible thing. So it's not the journalist's job to do a PR you know, story for the, for the church, but they do have the responsibility to say something more about the community, make a, a well-rounded story. And likewise, you know, as religious communities, we have to not be so sensitive to the fact that we're going to get criticized. criticized. You know, we, we want to be out in the public square, and we want to be respected, and uh, some of that is going to be based upon how we treat other people with respect, how we take criticism, and what we're willing to reveal about ourselves and our, our traditions and beliefs. So, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record again, but it really helps to have someone in that newsroom who understands, for example, that the African-American church may be political lens, liberal on some issues, but still be conservative on others, and that they have religious theological reasons for both. Right. Someone in the newsroom has to know that. If I could give you all here in the Rocky Mountain West just one funny example. When I was at the Rocky Mountain News a long time ago, the business desk, someone from the business desk walked over and said, there's some group moving to Colorado Springs called Focus on the Family. <laughs> Is that a big story? <laughs> Is that worth a brief? <laughs> you know, and, and I said, you know, after I got up off the floor, after falling out of my chair, I said, this needs to be on page one in 64-point type. 
when we look back a decade from now, this is going to be one of the 10 biggest stories in Colorado in the entire decade. There was no one else in the newsroom who had ever heard of Focus on the Family, <laughs> which at that time was the number one syndicated radio show in America. Wow. What a story. Interesting. Can okay. I just yeah. say one thing about what Emma was talking about? I think balance, which we all understand is part of a journalist's job, but balance means different things for different communities depending on who your audience is. And so in this, this plays out into uh, people's ability to individualize stories as opposed to collectivize them. Meaning what? If I, I was raised in Texas and stories about evangelical Christians uh, that may have portrayed a particular individual or actor or church in a negative light, most of the readers, many of whom were evangelical Christians because of the population, because of their identity and their, and their experience, could intuitively understand, well, that, there's something wrong with that person, right? or those people are bad apples. They're not going to read that and say, oh my gosh, we've got a serious problem with this entire faith community, correct? As opposed to if you're in another environment where evangelical Christians are the minority and most who, people who are reading it don't know about them and may only be hearing negative things, they're going to think, yeah, they, this is going to paint them with a broad brush. So the point is context matters of who your audience is and I think that then journalists have to keep that in mind because I do think they're the fourth branch of government, the unofficial fourth branch of government. What you write affects judges, it affects legislators, and it certainly affects the executive branch. And that's a very heavy burden to carry, uh, I appreciate that. But I think it also means that you have to be very thoughtful, particularly when dealing with religion um, and religious communities, of how can I both do my job uh, and, and meet my fiduciary duty to the public, but also do it in a way that does, does no harm unintentionally. So I want to move towards discussing um, sort of conservative and liberals and, and whether or not those labels are helpful in getting it right in reporting on religion. And I, I want to ask the question this way. What are the tensions in seeing religion on a conservative to liberal spectrum? Certainly, I think this is one spectrum that many readers or viewers understand. But is it really helpful in getting religion? And is it meaningful? And I think even in politics in recent years, we've seen sort of this traditional left-right divide been challenged in many ways. So what are your thoughts on this dynamic in reporting on religion? Well, I would be the number one uh, person to join the team of let's throw out the left-right default spectrum and the Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal being the frame through which we understand everything, in part because of what I, I mentioned earlier, that this is not necessarily the appropriate door to walk through, the appropriate frame to be carrying into any given story, um, in part because that may be not how those communities identify themselves and understand themselves. Um, but I think one of the key uh, features of many religious groups in the United States, not all, but many, uh, is a sort of challenging of our traditional no notions of what is conservative and liberal, which in the United States maps on to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Um, I think the Catholic Church offers a great example of this. Uh, so the Catholic Church is, by definition, a conservative institution in the sense that it conserves tradition. Um, it has a, an enormous uh, sort of amount that pulls it magnetically towards trying to stay, uh, have fidelity, maintain fidelity to doctrine. Um, certainly, uh, many Catholics and Catholic clergy hold positions that would be considered conservative in the United States, such as opposition to same-sex marriage, opposition to abortion. But by turns, uh, the Catholic uh, teachings also support a very uh, broad understanding of government support uh, and social welfare, uh, wanting to have that sort of collectivist understanding of, of the social good. Um, yeah, it's a very communitarian tradition. Um, and as we've seen just recently, uh, the Catholic Church has been one of the strongest voices for immigrants and refugees, um, has spoken out repeatedly against uh, the Trump administration and the Obama administration on policies around deportations. Um, again, sort of rooted in a conservative notion that the family unit is at the center of, of human life, but that 
takes a form that we don't recognize as being conservative in the United States. Um, so I think anyone who's carrying those frames of Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal into this world and holds to those too tightly is going to immediately be tripped up because that example is just one of many um, where those labels just don't fit. I can't repeat my whole workshop from earlier today because <laughs> some I, people I, probably weren't there. So yeah, why don't you just put it in that show? I opened by saying the labels have got to go, and I told a story from a, a number of years ago when I was invited to go to Prague, and I ended up speaking to the team of Radio Afghanistan. So I was the only non-Muslim in the room, and I says, "Okay, why am I here? Why did y'all want me here?" And they asked specifically, "Why do Americans insist on calling Muslims moderate or fundamentalist?" These words mean nothing in Afghanistan. They have no relation to how Muslims think about their faith. So while I frantically tried to get my act together and think, I turned the question around and I said, why do you think Americans in the media insist on using those two labels? And um, a Muslim man from the region said, I think moderate means Muslims America likes mm -hmm. and fundamentalist means Muslims America doesn't like. And I said, that's exactly true. And that's exactly how the terms are used to describe evangelicals and Catholics and Orthodox Jews and a host of others. So we spent the next hour in that session trying to figure out how in the context of Afghanistan to not describe people with labels, but instead in brief broadcast size bites Describe them in relation to the issue you're actually covering. And the one that was hot at that moment was young women in education. Mm -hmm. And instead of just calling them moderate or fundamentalist, we were trying to say, okay, what are they actually saying about the role of women in Afghanistan? And what are they saying specifically about access to education for young women, for girls? And that's very picky and sensitive work. It also requires them being willing to talk to you. But that is so much better than just pinning labels, stapling them to people's heads, and thinking you've somehow told people what they believe. It just doesn't work that way. I want to say thank you for all of that. I, I agree. The, the labels are not very useful. And... Um, again, thank the sponsors of this conference for that because I've heard lots of interesting discussions where people have had to shake their ideas based upon the first label that they put together. And I, to connect it back to the overall uh, theme of the conference, there's a religious freedom problem in this too in that our, uh, our religious freedom tradition in America involves this separation of the institutions of church and state and that whether you like or dislike that term, whether you use it you know, for a specific legal metaphor or you, you say it's bad, the separation of church and state is not in the Constitution and people have just used that to get religion out of the public square. I, I've been in every one of those conversations and I, I can be in more of them. Um, but the fact is that we have lost some of our appreciation for religious freedom in the way that uh, religion and government are separate. And often um, religious people have uh, given up their voices and accepted these labels of liberal and conservative that fit more to political parties than they actually represent their rich religious traditions. Oh, no thanks. Okay. Um, I think we will open it up to questions because we have uh, so many wonderful panelists here. I'm sure you want to ask them some questions. So um, why don't we have the microphone go out so that we can hear the questions. And remember, we are uh, streaming this on Facebook Live. So if you could please hold the microphone closely to your mouth so we can hear your question and people on Facebook can as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very grateful for this wonderful panel. Uh, my question is, uh, as I've observed the coverage of journalism through my scholarly work, or the coverage of religion by journalism in my scholarly work, I think I've observed something interesting, which is that the doctrinal underpinnings of how people make decisions sometimes seems to get short shrift in coverage. I, I like looked at the coverage of my, uh, my tender book of Mormon, which I love so much, and you can find out almost nothing about it in the New York Times, in the Washington Post. I think the same is true about the Holy Quran. Uh, and I'm interested in 
Uh, my guess is that Orrin Hatch thought about the Book of Mormon when he decided on whether to vote to invade Iraq or not, because there's stuff in there about that, or at least you can imply it. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, do, you, do others of you perceive that to be a potential place for more fruitful discussion in religion reporting? Well, I think you've pointed to uh, one of the main challenges for the religion beat, which is that it's a technical beat in a way that is often not appreciated. Uh, and the level of knowledge that's required for the kind of engagement that you're indicating to really probe, okay, Senator Orrin Hatch is making a decision. What is it about the text that he's looking toward that would help him think in that way? Um, that's a level of sophistication that very few people have. Um, and when you multiply that across all of the traditions that religion reporters are responsible for covering in all of these different contexts and depths, it's a, it's a tall order. But um, none of that is to say that it's not important. And I think that this all the more underscores the need for people who do have that technical savvy, because you have made exactly, I think, the point that all of us have been trying to make up here, that uh, these things matter. And they matter not only for getting the full story, but really understanding core motivations for people. And so sometimes the lack of understanding on some of these issues is really amazing. I'm sure most people remember when, when Donald Trump went to Liberty University and referred to two Corinthians, and suddenly everybody in the media became an expert on the fact that you don't say that two Corinthians. <laughs> you say that second Corinthians. You know, the New York Times was among those kind of how, reporting on just how big a mistake that was. But then, you know, in the year or two before that, the New York Times had run a story where they referred to Corinthians such and such without putting first or second Corinthians, obviously not understanding that there were two books of Corinthians. So sometimes it's the media is, it, when there's a big one like that, like the Corinthians thing, they're big to jump on it. I think everybody's probably read a lot about Romans 13 this week. <laughs> but in general, it's just, it's easier, as Terry said at his session today, to put it in political terms and not to try to get down in the nitty-gritty of what various holy books are teaching and how that's influencing people's lives. So, yeah, unfortunately, the Quran is sometimes addressed in the media in ways that take it completely out of context. So they, people will selectively take a verse, not even a complete verse, and, and quote it and then you know, claim that this then justifies you know, the Islam is violent and Muslims support Al-Qaeda or ISIS or whatever designated terrorist group. And uh, again, there is a, a political agenda. These individuals or these journalists who do this, my understanding is that they are not on the, religions, on the religion beat. They, again, tend to be more looking through their beat is war, uh, oftentimes, or, or counterterrorism. So uh, I think most Muslims don't want the Holy Quran to be covered in the media because the, the intentions are usually not good, and, and also, I agree. I mean, many of us, I, I'm a Muslim and I'm a lay Muslim, and I, <laughs> you have to go to get a degree to really understand Islamic studies. It is in itself a degree that, that people pursue uh, in Muslim-majority countries. Um, so to expect that of journalists is, is pretty hard. Uh, so then you use experts. Right, then you can use and, and interview experts and just ensure that they do have the bona fides, that they in fact have a degree, that they have studied it intensively um, through some form of, of a divinity-like school, which tends to be international because to my knowledge there isn't one in, in the United States, but, but I may be wrong, maybe there's something new. The other thing that's really important is w this conversation implies that we're talking about the first tier media, uh, the highest quality media. The media that um, has the ethical norms and of, of professionalism are the highest, or at least strives to be the highest. There are many tiers of media, and unfortunately, uh, a large number of people who read about certain faith communities, particularly, let's say, Islam and Muslims, are reading uh, third or fourth tier media in terms of quality, and also what I call faux media which are these blogs that by people who claim to know what they're talking about and they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so when you're to, there's a lot of coverage, unfortunately, about Islam, but in a way that's really negative. So if you read things from Daniel Pipes, Steve Emerson, Robert Spencer, uh, Pamela Geller, Bridget Gabriel, uh, Stephen Horowitz, if those are authors you're reading, 
you are being indoctrinated to believe that Islam is violent, and you are being misled and defrauded, in my opinion, because those individuals have openly uh, made it clear that they have a political agenda to defame uh, that entire faith community. Uh, and many people don't know that. They don't know that these individuals have this very clear agenda. So it's, I mean, it, it's a complicated matter for this particular faith community, uh, but, but I understand, I mean, I take your point in terms of the, the lack of coverage. Yeah. In the mid 80s, um, I was offered a chance to interview two of the 12 leaders of the LDS church, um, Monson and Packer because there had been some horrible coverage of the church in the Denver Post. So they went to the Rocky Mountain News and offered me this exclusive interview. In preparing for that interview, I had done a lot of reading in history classes, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, about LDS Church and Mormon issues and controversies. I was very familiar with the critics. I just offer this as another tip. The material that I found the most helpful as an entryway into the Mormon Church was I bought a stack of Sunday school material addressing specifically teenagers and found that how the church told its story at that level was actually helpful in getting images that helped me relate that to the public and what they might think. The other thing that helped me the most was a hymn book. Yeah. How people sing their faith is often a very sharp door that's a mixed metaphor, an open door <laughs> into their emotions and into the side of their faith that's not just intellect. Always look at people's worship books and their hymn books as a way into their thought. That's fascinating. Thank you. Any other comments on this question or we'll move on to the next question? Okay. Um, where's the microphone? Yes, down here. Um, what if you belong to a church or an institution and you're dealing with a uh, media outlet that is reliably hostile. Uh, and do you have any tips for um, how to uh, approach what you anticipate to be covers that is unlikely to be fair-minded? Besides tape recording the interview. <laughs> uh, silence <laughs> is not going to make the stories go away. So some sort of careful interaction in face-to-face -face interviews, and yes, if you record it, that will help. It might help to prepare some very detailed printed statements, but always have someone who understands the press involved in that process. This is why you need a press committee mm -hmm. that knows what reporters know what or don't. I mean, you, you need to, to go to school yourself on that issue. And let me just make a selfish plug. Um, I, I think in the context of a single interview, one particular story, what Terry said seems wise. Um, and I'll leave it to him to give the, the wise tips of media training. Um, but I think thinking about the long-term goal of uh, how a certain religious group is perceived, the kind of uh, public understanding and assumption that's made around those groups, um, I think there's a lot that can be said for having an approach that um, takes the offenses rather than just being on the defensive. And what I mean by that is not, again, to be in the train, uh, to be in the mode of media training you, but rather um, you should seek out fair-minded reporters <laughs> and uh, help them help them get the stories. Um, help them, you know, really get access to the players who matter and get them the facts that matter. And people who know this world will be able to recognize a good story when it comes to them. Um, that's again, I'm not saying you know feed people stories. Journalists will just take your stories and eat them with sugar and they'll just swallow them. I'm saying that um, one way of dealing in the long run with outlets who are treating you in a hostile way, probably based on assumptions, is to, when you're not dealing with that, seek out the reporters who actually are fair and try to develop a relationship with them and be willing to give them the things that they need in order to write good, fair stories about you. And that sounds like what Terry described with the Denver Post treating the right. LDS right. unfairly and then going to Terry at the Rocky Mountain News. That's right, yeah. Any other comments? I would just say do your due diligence on the journalist read their stories, find out, because you can then predict the questions. Um, and, you know, 
don't answer their question, answer the question you want them to ask you and take control of the interview. It'll frustrate them to no end, but you'll technically be cooperating. <laughs> now, this might be the odd, odd tip of the day. You can imagine me recommending this in an evangelical seminary. I would often recommend to church leaders that they read a classic book from the gay rights movement called After the Ball, written by two uh, gay public relations officials. And basically what it says is how they intended to change America's mind on this issue in the upcoming two decades. They lay out all of their media thoughts, their strategies, how to relate to the press, how to frame issues, et cetera. It's the single best book on the topic I've read. Um, and read it with an open mind, but just read it as a piece of education about the media. Where's our next question? Yes, down here in front. Thank you all very much uh, for sharing your wisdom. So I feel very much like, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to ask an ignorant question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You've sort of indicated that, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to label people conservative or liberal when you're, when you're covering these stories about religion. Um, and yet my feeling is, as a religious person, that all of this is actually very politically loaded, that the coverage is loaded, that the reporters are politically loaded. So it seems to me that, in general, it's not the unusual for a media outlet to be hostile towards a story of religion or religious groups, but that's uh, rather tends to be generally the case. So maybe I'm ignorant about this, but I even think about the March for Life in Washington, the numbers of people who get who come out, and the cone of silence, the fact that it barely gets any coverage. So this whole thing seems extremely politically loaded, and it also seems to me that that for some religious groups, politics is very much at the heart of what they are doing. White evangelicals and their outstanding uh, support for Trump. The black church and the fact that we all vote Democratic no matter what. Is it really realistic to sort of, not, isn't there an elephant in the room? And what do we do about, if it's true that there is this kind of hostile attitude towards religion, which I think is a kind of elite reaction to religion. What do we do about that? Well, um, I think you are correct, uh, essentially, and that in many newsrooms, um, beyond just a level of um, either benign or not so benign ignorance, which is what we've been discussing, sometimes there's an outright hostility. I think this particularly shows up when uh, religious belief brings people into arenas that, as you pointed out with the example of the March for Life, are very politically loaded and have to do with the policies of the United States. Um, and in general, there's a default posture on the abortion issue, certainly, uh, that one side is the side of the right and one side is the side of the reactionaries. And that's the position that's taken. Um, I think, first, there are reporters, although probably not uh, all that many, who want to tell a story fairly and accurately. And cultivating, through the media center that you will now set up based on Terry's advice, um, <laughs> cultivating relationships with those people who not only get religion, but don't assume that religious beliefs are wrong by definition, um, is wise and can be constructive on both sides. Um, and then the second thing, just sort of getting to your point about the fundamentally political nature of all of this, I don't mean to say by sitting up here and talking about the right door and the wrong door and the many metaphors of doors that we've been tossing around, um, that religion is apolitical. In fact, I very much don't believe that. I think the way that we write about politics in the American media is actually quite bad in the sense that we think about politics 
in the sort of formal big P sense, it's elections, it's Democrats, Republicans, it's the people at the DCCC, it's not politics little p, as in polities, groups of people who come together and have political aspects to what they're doing, they're acting politically within a polity. Um, that aspect of religion, I am deeply interested in. Um, I think the difference is not conflating um, those labels of politics big P with politics little p, sort of understanding uh, the polities that animate these different communities that you're, you're describing um, and describing them on their own terms. Go ahead. Okay, another unusual statement about the elephant that you're mentioning. Conservative institutions in America in the world of religion, primarily evangelical Protestants and traditional Catholics, are also paying the price for their 50-year hatred of journalism and demeaning its valid role in American life and culture. It's the other side of a blind spot with the First Amendment that we have two major institutions in American public life that do not respect each other and do not have a lot of contact. And ironically, it's the two halves of the First Amendment. A lot of this is that their schools have not been willing to train journalists in mainstream. They've taught them PR. They've taught them all kinds of other things. They haven't respected journalism. That's the other half of the equation of a lot of journalists not respecting the world of religion. And those two painful problems are in many ways connected. So I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, but it just your question triggered some thoughts that I had, which is, uh, particularly as an attorney, is what do how do we understand the the notion of separation of church and state, and you know where you stand or where you sit at the at a table certainly affects that. You know whether you're in the majority or the minority or the uber minority, whether your faith tends to have high representation in governance. Uh, by virtue of its membership, even if numerically you may not be the majority. All of those affect your definition of separation of, of church and state. And what seems, at least just, and I'm not um, an expert, obviously, on American history, but what I, one of the challenges that I face often when I'm asked, you know, well, why isn't there this concept in these Muslim-majority countries? Because it's, it really is a very American concept. And um, at least I wasn't raised as a Muslim, where it's like, okay, Islam is in your private life, and then you go out of the door, and Islam's not relevant. And so this concept of what's private and what's public and where is the role of religion is something that perhaps by design, you know, based on the way that our Constitution was written, will be this perennial conflict of where does the public square, you know, at what point does religion enter the public square? And so I think what religious groups are doing, and rightfully so in a democracy, is they are uh, seeking to not limit their religious beliefs or their religious actions just within their homes or within their houses of worship, which is a very narrow view of, you know, the private role or the private sphere of religion. But once you go into the public square, farther and farther and you get into politics, whether it's with a big P or a small P, then you are in an adversarial environment and you know, as attorneys we're, we're, we think that's normal. Um, and then it's a matter of, of playing the, the game and as long as the rules are fair and it's, everybody gets a fair shot at it. The, the, I think the challenge is, and, and you know, this is beyond the scope of this discussion, is when religion officially becomes uh, the form of governance. Right. And I think journalists seem to struggle with that is there's a difference between covering the people of a particular faith community versus the religion. And, and I, I personally, and I'm, again, I'm an immigrant to this country from a country where the separation, that's not, that's not what my parents were raised on, is I don't know if I'm comfortable with um, journalists covering religion, theology. I, I'm comfortable with them covering the people and the communities and their role in societies and, and their engagement in politics and providing, and if religion is relevant to the backdrop and the context to understanding that. And this maybe goes to the, uh, the other gentleman's question is, I'm not sure that's really their role, nor should, are they really that qualified to do it because a lot of people of faith don't realize that religious freedom and the establishment, the establishment clause in particular was there to protect religions from having the government interfere in their affairs. 
You know, a lot of people think it's, it's, a perse it's persecution against people of faith that they can't go into the government and, and influence the government through their theology, but it's actually the opposite as well that once you get the state and the religion too intermingled, the state starts to control the religion, and that, I think, historically has not turned out well, at least in European history, is my understanding. Okay, another question in the middle, yeah. So earlier this year, there was a, an article published um, about the passing of the Mormon prophet, Thomas S. Monson, that was rather, I think many Mormons felt like it was disparaging very slanted. Um, I'm interested to hear from the panel if anyone's read the article or, or watched that story. Was that fair in your in your mind? And a secondary question to that would be... Noah and Micah, your mom is looking for you. Please meet her at Jamba Juice. <laughs> oh no, those poor kids. <laughs> okay, every so, mother's heart is like beating really fast right now. Okay, could you repeat the last part of your question? Yeah, Thanks. so just my follow-up question to that is, what's a, f what's a question you can ask yourself to say, if it's, if it's an article about your religion that hits close to home, to figure out, is this fair or not? So are you familiar with the I article he's referring to about I President am. Monson's passing? Okay. I actually wrote a, a, a post for getreligion.org about that article. And, and to me, the thing that was unfair about it was the fact that it, it was somebody, I don't remember how old he was when he died. I'm thinking he was in his 80s or his 90s and had been involved with the LDS church his entire life and obviously was a very important figure. Let Yet the the opening paragraph of the story was you know his name comma something along the lines who opposed same sex marriage and women's right. role you know improvement or rights or something like that in the LDS church and and to me the unfair thing about it journalistically was you you're taking him and I think it was the New York Times where I read the article and basically they were judging him through the prism of New York you know the most important issues to the New York Times and kind of their litany of politically correct issues where every, you know, you have good guys and bad guys, and so he was a bad guy on two key, you know, at least editorially speaking, maybe not the newsroom. I'm, I'm rambling, but I, I do agree that that article was unfair, and I can forget the second part of the question. Well, so um, we have a great journalist, my colleague at the Atlantic, McKay Coppins, um, who is a politics reporter, but he is sort of a, a freelance religion reporter in the sense that he moonlights on the religion beat. And he wrote a response to that obituary in the New York Times. And the point that he essentially made, I think, undergirds what we've been talking about, um, that covering religious communities or religious figures uh, is often the task of understanding how they understand themselves. And certainly, I think it is fair and the job of journalists writing an obituary to isolate the core challenges or debates that characterized a leader's tenure in office, in part because that's what religious life is. People disagree with each other, and, and that's part of it. Um, but McKay also pointed out that he was a beloved leader, um, and this was as much part of his legacy within the LDS world, uh, and not acknowledging that and, and making that part of the story it was a real real short sight and, and not really getting the full, full part of the story. Um, so I guess all of that is to answer the second part of your question, which is um, I think something being fair is not necessarily that someone within a particular religious tradition would have written a story that way way or that they agree with everything in it, um, but that they recognize themselves in it. That's always my goal, um, that when I am working with sources, when I'm going into communities, when we come out the other side, my goal is not for them to love the story. My goal is for them to see themselves in the story and believe that the reality that they occupy resembles the reality that I'm conveying in my stories. media is working with words and how our words affect each other, how our words isolate groups. Um, what's, the, what's the bad word now or the bad um, cliche talking about white middle-aged males as I look around this room and, and the Me Too movement and how we're trying to disparage with words an entire group. 
whether you say um, white evangelical conservatives, we are we are taking group. We're making groups out of individuals who are so different. The Baptists down in the South are not all the same, whatever color they are. Conservatives are not all the same, whatever color we are. We didn't have the choices we all wanted in an election. So, as so what's your question? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm getting carried away. So my question is, as media and as attorneys, tell us what what you're doing with words to to collectivize Americans, to say we're all Americans, to say we have some unified goals. What, how do you do that with your words? Thank you. OK, another elephant in the living room. <laughs> right now, because of the crisis in the American news industry related to advertising, basically people are being taught how to weaponize words to produce the most clicks on the internet. Unfortunately, people click and pass on things that make them mad, things that they already agree with, and this is tending to make us, if anything, less careful with words instead of more. And there's an actual technical and economic reason for this, and I don't have an answer to it. I wish I did. It frustrates me. It makes me fear greatly both for my industry and for public discourse in America. But it's a reality. People want to read things that make them feel they're right automatically without listening to anybody on the other side, and they want those words crafted in such a way that it makes them mad. See Twitter. <laughs> Emma already spoke about that today. Yeah. <laughs> Nasty yeah. place. Okay. Uh, the only thing I would add that we can all do is to reiterate the points really that you started making before you asked your question, which is to recognize religious diversity, uh, recognize it with our own communities. I've talked to a lot of you. You don't all think the same way. All of you that are part of the LDS Church, of course you don't. And, uh, and I heard someone, one of the speakers said something about Baptist life I was, uh, and, and, and made an assumption that therefore it meant this, and I know that it doesn't. I didn't, he didn't mean to, so it's, it's, it's not a big deal, but just to recognize religious diversity, to hold up a variety of different voices um, is, is, is helpful. Um, and I think for all of us to not deny the realities that we know of our, con our, our neighbor that we love that is of a different perspective, whether religiously, politically, culturally, that while we, we, we're being called to enter into conversations and to find common ground and to reaffirm a vision of religious liberty that can unite us, that we have to start off by simply recognizing each other and seeing each other. And I think that's a great place to end. Will you please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists? Thank you guys. <laughs>